Um, d delighted that you're with us for, for this uh, important panel. Um, my name is Daniel Philpot. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. I've been working in peace building as a scholar and an activist uh, for some 25 years, peace building and uh, justice and reconciliation. And um, so very delighted to uh, convene this conversation here at this important conference. Over the past generation, the world has seen an intense wave of peace building efforts, ones that commonly seek to address the injustices and violence of the past in building a just and sustainable and peaceful future. Th these efforts involve or stand at the convergence of two global trends. One of these trends is the coming to an end of periods of uh, great injustices and societal efforts to deal with past injust injustices in building peace. One form of these injustices are democratization, or sorry, dictatorships, which yield to democratization. Another is civil war and genocide, large-scale violence that lead to peace settlements. Another are the widespread cases of mistreatment of people in the histories of Western democracies, such as treatment of slaves or native peoples. I think of the Canadians, for instance, and the Truth Commission they had regarding the uh, residential schools in the past. So there has been this kind of wave of efforts of societies all over the world. I can talk about South Africa, Ireland, Germany, East Timor, Guatemala, Chile, virtually every continent, efforts to make a transition of a kind of leaving behind or confronting past injustices in order to try to create a just society. The, the two trends are, are the settlements of these wars, but also the proliferation. The second trend is a proliferation of novel institutions to conduct this effort. What do I mean? Well, we've seen the emergence of over 40 truth commissions designed to confront and learn about the past, and creating a just future. Trials, the International Criminal Court and the tribunals and national level trials. Reparations settlements, political apologies, all at the level of the state. We've also seen a proliferation of efforts of NGOs on the ground um, all around the world and non-state actors to engage in very important work in building peace. And one of these is the Catholic Church, which because of its global connectivity and its presence at the level of all uh, levels of society, it has been involved in both the state-led efforts and in non-state efforts on the grassroots to build peace. One of the paradigms that has emerged for peace building is reconciliation, which comes out of the Christian tradition and has widespread global resonance. We've also seen the emergence of the paradigm of peace building. Now, at one point, the conversation used to be dominated by the just war tradition. Then the big challenger there was pacifism, whether you could have a just war, various variants of that. But as more and more societies seem to try to get past war and build peace, we started to see peacemaking, which was the idea of trying to bring peace settlements where there was war. But even beyond and wider than, than that was the, um, is the paradigm of peace building, which is a holistic effort to try to build peace in, a, in an entire society in a way that recognizes the interdependence of various sectors and levels of society. So it can't just be a matter of just war, can't just be a matter of peacemaking, but now is peace building of trying to um, knit peace across the societies that have had systemic and widespread injustices and violence in the past. Well, to help us think about this, we have um, some uh, wonderful um, panelists now, being a panel on peace building and transitional justice, 
we are competing with the real world of uh, transitional justice and, and peace building. Um, this panel in particular will focus on truth as a foundation for transitional justice and reconciliation. And it is in that regard that we've got the Colombian election and the impending release of the report of the Colombian Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We had two panelists lined up from Colombia to speak about that, who unfortunately um, could not join us. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we have two, um, at, at the moment, two uh, wonderful panelists, possibly a third to join us, and um, who will speak to us on this um, critical and central dimension of peace building, truth as a foundation for transitional justice and reconciliation. So let me first introduce a very uh, special person who has been a very special voice in the conversation on peace, healing, reconciliation, truth. He is Maka Black Elk, who is the executive director for Truth and Healing at the Red Cloud Indian School in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, a former Indian boarding school. Maka Black Elk was a teacher and an educational administrator at Red Cloud before taking on his current role. A descendant of boarding school survivors, Maka brings a passion for interreligious dialogue to his work. He served as the chairperson of the American Indian Catholic Schools Network for four years and has advocated for truth and healing in Catholic ministries and schools serving indigenous peoples. Then our other uh, panelist who is with us um, on the webinar right now is the Reverend Peter John Pearson, who is Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Cape Town and Director of the Catholic Parliamentary Liaison Office of the Southern African Catholic Bishops Conference. In that position, Peter John Pearson helps leads the Bishop's public policy advocacy. He began his journey to the priesthood after studying law and having experienced profound spiritual conversion linked to his involvement in the Catholic charismatic renewal movement and a passion for social justice in service of the poor. I've had the privilege of knowing Father Peter John for many, many years and worked with him in peace building and very honored to come to know um, uh, Maka Black Elk uh, today and much more recently. Well, um, we had originally had five to 10 minutes for our panelists, or five minutes. We were gonna be, have a very strict five minutes. We can now be a little more relaxed and even as panel, panel chair, which I have to exercise in a way that strictly uh, is very worried about proliferating time, I think we can relax that to five or 10 minutes. And then I've got some juicy questions to guide us for um, 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor to questions uh, from, from these panelists. So um, why don't we begin with um, Maka Black Elk, and we'll give you the floor and I'd love to hear your insights on these topics. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, as Daniel said, my name is Maka Black Elk. I am the Executive Director for Truth and Healing at Red Cloud Indian School in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Uh, the work that uh, we are currently engaged in at Red Cloud Indian School is really the work of, of, of truth seeking. In particular, we are uh, you'll find ourselves uh, as a former Indian boarding school, one that was part of a, a whole system of institutions across the United States and Canada that uh, has instituted across really decades now, across generations of Native American families, uh, a process by which children were uh, system systematically removed from their homes. Uh, sent to these boarding schools 
and engaged in what the recent department, U.S. Department of Interior report uh, on the boarding school history of the United States called identity altering methodologies, uh, which was aimed at uh, erasure of indigenous language, of indigenous uh, culture, of spirituality, uh, and any other form of indigenous practice that was deemed uh, savage and uncivilized. And so these schools were were uh, in the uh, in, in the business of changing families and changing children uh, and separating children from their parents and families. And this uh, history spans again multiple generations. Uh, so our school is just one of those institutions uh, from history. We are no longer a boarding school, uh, but our our boarding formally ended in 1980 uh, and in the and really opened in 1888 so you know not quite a hundred years of students who experienced uh, life as a boarder uh, in this institution from as young as five years old uh, our work uh, we call truth and healing which we can talk more about in the conversation and or in the panel to come we, we specifically choose not to use the term reconciliation. And that's because though it, you know, obviously is steeped in immense tradition and uh, in, in a really particularly powerful theology in the Catholic church, there is something about the term reconciliation for indigenous people, especially in the United States and in Canada, um, where there is a sense that reconciliation isn't truly possible. Because reconciliation, at least for most people, imply a particular uh, kind of power balance. That there are two people of sort of equal standing who have somehow wronged each other and then can come to the table in a sort of mutual way and, and agree to sort of uh, right those wrongs. Uh, the sense for Indigenous peoples is that's just not the case for uh, the power and balance embedded in this particular relationship, the relationship between indigenous peoples and their colonial government. Um, but there is no really coming to an equal table uh, because uh, not all of the things that would necessitate an equal uh, meeting uh, are even on the table to begin with. So we, we avoid the term reconciliation because of that sort of political uh, nature of it. But we do believe that healing is possible, but healing is only possible when the truth is revealed. Uh, so that is where we are in the beginning of our process. We are engaging in the work of meeting with our boarding school alumni and survivors. The furthest we can really go back at this point is people who attended the institution in the 1940s uh, and 1950s. Those people are now in their, in their uh, 70s, 80s, and potentially 90s for some of our oldest boarding school survivors. And that actually does allow us to get a picture of what these schools might have been like, particularly in an era that was still uh, predominantly assimilative. Um, you know, these boarding schools did tend to change over time. As you get into the 1960s and 70s, schools across the country uh, started to become a bit more uh, aware of issues of civil rights, issues of multiculturalism, and begin to shy away from former practices that would limit culture, limit language and spirituality, and instead started to adopt practices that enhance those things. But prior to the 1960s, we can get a glimpse of what it was like uh, for people who attended these institutions when the paradigm was still very much about uh, the, the primary motivation of killing the Indian and saving the man, uh, which was the, the theme of boarding schools across the country. So we are in the midst of, again, engaging with that group in particular. It requires a lot of work, uh, a lot of work of reaching out. The pandemic has made that difficult, especially with this particular population who are uh, much more vulnerable. Uh, and our efforts to collect their stories, 
and hear their stories and have their stories be told um, also comes with the re-engagement of potential traumatic experiences. And so even as we move through this process of collecting the stories of people who were involved in this effort or involved in this, in this history, uh, we have to be aware of their ongoing needs and also follow up um, for those needs because, you know, as things surface, as their memories resurface of their experiences in these schools, uh, some positive, some negative, uh, those different, but especially as those traumatic experiences emerge, uh, the residual effect of that can be um, quite painful um, and can be long lasting beyond the interview beyond the, the actual collection of that particular uh, uh, experience. So the work of, of truth seeking, of truth telling, um, starts with the acknowledgement of every individual's experience being, uh, being valid and being important to be told. Uh, and so it's our really in our early work at this point, uh, a matter of engaging with the people um, and finding who they are uh, and making sure that we can connect with them uh, as best as we can. Being that we represent the perpetrator institution, that also comes with a very particular uh, challenge because there are people who are, of course, uh, extremely leery, if not outright um, uh, skeptical of the intentions of the institution that was formerly the perpetrators of this historical harm. That also comes with a, a very difficult uh, paradigm being a Catholic institution. Uh, the Catholic Church has a very particularly storied relationship with uh, colonialism in general, especially of the Americas and of, you know, Australia and New Zealand. Um, so the relationship between many indigenous peoples and the broader Christian faith, but in particular the Catholic Church, can be really fraught uh, because of that history um, where the Catholic Church played a very particular role in operating these schools uh, and in uh, in promoting a particular type of uh, assimilation that uh, implied, or not implied, but directly, uh, directly communicated that in order to be uh, a, a fully civilized human being, you had to no longer be indigenous in your culture and in your expression. You had to become a particular cultural expression of Christian. Um, and so, that history, along with the experiences of, of people in these schools, having those direct traumatic experiences, makes this a really challenging uh, effort to even begin the process of, of story collection, of testimonial collection. Um, but that's the hurdle that we have to overcome um, because that's the most important part of this process um, is uh, the gathering of testimony, the sharing of that of that testimonial experience, and the ability for those who, ex especially those who experience trauma directly, to receive support as they share their experiences, um, and then from that point we can begin talking about what comes next after truth seeking, uh, whether that's uh, a healing of some kind. You know, there are lots of processes that follow. Uh, but the very beginning of this work is really relationship building, trust building, uh, and a, a sincere effort to support individuals as they share their stories. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do and where we are in our particular effort of this one Catholic school, this one former Catholic boarding school in the United States that has this, that has this shared history with this massive system of boarding schools that existed across the nation and to and in our northern neighbors in Canada, uh, where their government, as, as Daniel mentioned, their government you know, engaged in an official truth and reconciliation commission for their entire nation. 
the United States uh, is not there yet um, and has not began that process yet. Uh, so we are one school, one community, uh, one uh, place that is a bigger part of this history, uh, trying to seek our own truth uh, amongst our community uh, and support their journey as they tell their story. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, um, uh, Maka, for those uh, extraordinary comments um, exactly uh, on the concerns and at the heart of the concerns of the, of the panel raises many interesting questions that I'd like to ask and others have already asked good questions. But let's now go to um, my my good friend, uh, Reverend Peter John Pearson for um, his um, five to 10 minutes of, of comments from South Africa. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I was fascinated by um, Um, to see where that those contestations of ideas um, would yield some positive uh, theological, but also uh, political and sociological insights. So thank you for that fascinating um, talk. Um, I think I and I just may I just pick up on one thing you said, um, and that was the contestation around the word um, reconciliation. Um, like yourself, we in South Africa um, held on to reconciliation as quite a privileged word in our um, struggle lexicon, quite a privileged word um, to think through the ravages of race and um, discrimination and injustice and, um, and the years of uh, colonial exploitation. Um, poverty and all of those things. And yet now, uh, 20 odd years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, that word is being called into question and the concept is being interrogated very strongly, precisely because as you said so well, um, there is this inequality of people around the table um, and something of a pipe dream that you know, we could all just come together, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, my Lord. Um, so there's a contestation around that that is only beginning to emerge. Um, and I'm grateful that you raised that. What I wanted to speak about primarily tonight was um, the discovery we made in the process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was the obvious fruit of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was um, finding knowledge and um, having knowledge verified um, in such a way that um, we had a basis from which to move, from which to shift. Um, the knowledge being a source of power in moving forward to a different uh, political dispensation. And that yielded some of the fruit. People know um, what happened, who bombed who, who assassinated who, um, and it's allowed people to grieve and to, um, and to think through um, their trauma and reach, in many cases, that post-traumatic paradigm. Um, with the questions of um, truth-telling and storytelling, um, validating um, the, their experience. And so truth as a means of validating um, experience has become quite an important contribution. And if we're trying to think beyond um, this era of, um, of trauma to uh, South Africa down the road, um, having that knowledge um, verified and having it validated for those who suffered and whose suffering was never acknowledged is an important step forward. Whether one can translate that um, from a personal level to a national experience, um, whether one can translate 
the healing of one person's trauma into a um, national experience or discussion, I think remains an open question that truth telling um, still needs to, to grapple with. So that's the one very obvious point. The second less obvious point, but a emphatically useful point has been the fact that truth telling has allowed voices that had been concealed, voices that had been marginalized, voices that had never even uh, been invited to a number of the tables of discussion or a number of um, analyses of experiences during times of repression to come to the fore and to bring their contributions, their stories of resilience, the stories of how people who are so marginalized that mainstream society scarcely knows their, their names or their grouping, um, how their stories of resilience, their strategies for survival, their um, strategies for overcoming, um, how those almost hidden strategies for survival broke um, the enigma of um, concealment and allowed them to um, make their stories known. Without that, we would most definitely have an even more incomplete story of the survival um, strategies that people had um, for coping with um, apartheid and the, um, and the years of colonial ravage. So um, the truth-telling aspect of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission by inviting these very forgotten, very marginalized voices to the fore added to our knowledge of how people exercised resilience, how they survived, and in many cases, how they found their own ways of surviving and resisting, which is an almost impossible combination for, for most people to think about in South Africa. But many of the smaller marginal communities found ways um, and often they were deeply indigenized ways of surviving, but also of, um, of resisting. And, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission brought that out to the fore in very interesting ways. And I want to just underline again that our record of how as a nation, how as, a, um, as oppressed people we were able to, um, to show resilience and to resist um, would have been very incomplete without those voices being brought to the fore in the process of truth telling. I'm of the opinion, um, thirdly, that one of the biggest contributions of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, to the process of um, recovering minimum, minimal, minimum a minimum of decency in our very hitherto indecent society has been the um, ability of the truth and reconciliation in a curious way. And I'm sure psychologists have something to say about this, but how the permission that the commission gave to people to speak publicly very difficult truths gave in a different way permission to people to speak what might be called more domestic truths, but which had been hidden, which were never spoken of publicly um, in all the years before. So these concealed voices, um, and I'm thinking, for instance, of the way in which domestic violence had never been spoken of publicly. Um, the way in which sexual identity orientation and all of those issues never been spoken, never had a public profile, a public voice, and there are many other areas, but somehow the, um, the permission given by the TRC 
to people to tell their big truths also gave permission um, in, um, you know, in a way for people to tell their own domestic truths and thus build up a much um, more honest society. It didn't, uh, it wasn't the guarantee of honesty. Our history since then has shown that, but it gave us um, the possibility of um, speaking one's own domestic truth and allowing it to um, receive in the best sense of the word publicity and validity and therefore affirmed people and their identities in ways that um, hadn't been possible in, a, um, in, in the apartheid times and in the kind of culture that apartheid inculcated not only politically in the nation, but the kind of secrecy, concealment, subversiveness that apartheid um, inculcated also in domestic situations, in families, in small groups. Um, and this, for me, perhaps the biggest um, gift of the TRC, I, I, I say that cautiously, but um, the, one of the biggest gifts of the TRC was that truth telling now also became a domestic um, priority and a domestic commitment. So truth telling for me um, is in those, uh, contributes positively in those three areas in um, establishing a record that validates people and their experiences, uh, truth telling as a mechanism for bringing concealed voices, marginalized voices to the discussion table and opening up histories of survival um, and of resilience that, and resistance that we would never have known before because they so deeply uh, concealed. And then truth telling as a permission for other truths, other hidden more domestic truths to come to the fore and enrich society and affirm people. Um, those um, then would be the three areas I would like to start this conversation with. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, thank you. One of the most interesting analyses of the Truth Commission I've heard. And uh, so it's a wonderful privilege to have that uh, with us. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm looking at our time here, juggling a couple things. Um, I want to get questions in from the audience. We also have the possibility of um, Bishu Matthew, Matthew uh, Kuka from Nigeria joining us. <clears throat> we want to give him time if he gets on. Um, let me ask one, one question, and then if we have time, we'll... Uh, and then I think I want to open up the floor to our questioners. We have seven terrific questions from uh, Mr. Raju Bhatt. If I don't hear from him, I may just choose one and, and ask it uh, for him. Um, and then all the while, we'll uh, be looking over our shoulders to see if uh, Bishop Kuka uh, uh, joins us. Um, here's my question. Um, both of you talked about some concerns about the term reconciliation which of course comes into the Christian tradition into Western society through the Apostle Paul and his description of God's um, uh, you know, restoration of the world through, through Christ and the cross, cross and resurrection. Um, but both of you seem to be concerned in the current climate about um, this being used as a kind of either mask for power or a kind of something that might be indifferent to the power imbalances and indifferent to the, um, you know, kind of lifting up the voices of those who are most disempowered, the, the survivors, the, the victims, and so forth. And I think um, you both pointed to truth as a very important part of that lifting up. I, my question is, um, given all that, is there, is there some important sense in which acknowledgement must also involve people from the perpetrator or from the kind of bystander side, maybe call that the kind of holders of power in the larger society. So in the Native Americans, in the um, um, in, in South Dakota, um, if we're going to have acknowledgement, must not there be some involvement of representatives of either the church or the surrounding community or um, what have you, those who maybe need to, you know, 
experience some more accountability, repentance, or at least awareness of this. And then um, for Reverend uh, Peter John, doesn't acknowledgement also involve the role of the perpetrators, the larger South African society and so forth? Isn't it a part that they, some movement among on their part that we also want to see? So um, but I'd love to hear both of you on, on that question. Shall I go first? Um, sure. I think the um, it's an excellent question. Even while the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was being um, designed, um, the primary purpose, and this was contested by many, um, by, for instance, the son of Steve Biko, um, son mm -hmm. of um, 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 a number of people who had died, the Ribeiro's children. Um, the desire, it seems, of the government of the day, that doesn't seem, the desire was to get the perpetrators to tell the truth. And the um, cadet was um, that there would be no, um, there'd be no punishment attached to it. Um, so it was a, a, a somewhat, people who likened it to the Catholic um, sacrament of reconciliation um, came a bit stuck because there was no, there was nothing the perpetrator had to do um, to show his, to even show his sentence. It wasn't required. All that was required was that the truth be told. Um, the, um, and there was nothing further required and the truth would give you amnesty. Um, and that has meant that in many, many communities, except where exceptional people, and it has been exceptional, um, also numerically, um, have come forward and said, I want to do something. I want to um, be part of a reconciliation with this community. I want to meet the family of the person I assassinated. Except where that's happened, it's left a huge um, vacuum um, that has not made reconciliation possible because all that was asked was um, acknowledgement of the truth. And that short-circuited the kind of reconciliation we know in religious communities where there has to be not only acknowledgement but some kind of um, engagement in putting right that which you've um, woefully wronged. So um, it is a gap um, uh, and it's been spoken of often and it's one of the reasons why um, people have critiqued the use of the word reconciliation. They're saying it's not recon should be called the Truth Acknowledgement Commission um, rather than reconciliation. So it's been absent from um, our, both our narrative and our discourse to, to our ultimate, uh, I think, um, uh, short-circuiting of what could have been a more profound kind of experience. Okay, great, thank you. Baka Black Elk. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to say um, around all of that. Uh, in my conversations with some of the survivors and alumni of the boarding school era that I've talked to, I think one of the themes that has come up over and over again um, is actually this, what, what I've heard some, uh, you know, survivors say, and I, and I think a very empowering way is that there's no such thing as collective healing. Um, there's no, there's also no such thing as collective trauma is what they're saying. Um, every single person experienced um, the, the different traumatic elements of the boarding school era uh, and reacted to those um, experiences in very different ways. And some people walked away from experiences of, of extreme abuse and use of corporal punishment or even sexual abuse and found ways to you know um, understand that experience for themselves and and heal from that in whatever way they needed to and others carry that pain very intensely um, and in some ways therefore the the power 
of acknowledgement um, can be a doorway for, for folks who need that, and, and a door for, the, for their own journey to healing. And for others, acknowledgement isn't enough and never will be enough because that pain that they hold um, isn't going to be healed from acknowledgement. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the survivors I've talked to, one of the uh, survivors I talked to said was, um, if, you're, if your abuser says sorry to you and, and says sorry that they did that and asks for your forgiveness, that in and of itself doesn't heal you. Uh, and the work of healing happens solely within the person who is holding that pain. Uh, and what they need is as diverse as, as there are people. Um, and so one of the things that that's done for me in this work is recognize that um, though we can, as institutions, as governments, as whatever it might be, right, we can implement and institute things that allow for individuals to embark on a healing journey for themselves. But we cannot make anybody heal. We cannot provide any kind of collective healing. Um, there is no such thing. We can only provide the, the different kinds of things that people need to move along their own healing journey. Um, and so I, to me, I think that's a very different way of thinking about it. Um, and one that I think is, is not something um, that truth and reconciliation commissions often uh, operate in that way. I think, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into a, a paradigm where a truth and reconciliation process starts and ends and the powers that be, you know, walk away from that thinking, okay, this issue is done um, and we can move on. Um, and, and that's just not true and I think we know we see that from experience in different places where truth and reconciliation commissions have happened this is never done because healing is ultimately an individual journey and therefore especially among perpetrators whether in my case as the as the school the catholic school that was once you know a, a, an institution that that operated this way whether it's the U.S. government whether it's the South African government or what have you, um, there needs to be a consistent and long-term uh, commitment to doing the work that needs to be done over and over again, because it's not something that just ends. Um, it's something that has to be really cyclical. Um, acknowledgement has to happen over and over again. This is why there, there's limitations around apology, right? I mean, Pope Francis recently apologized to a Canadian delegation of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people about the residential school system in Canada. And while apology is incredibly powerful, it's a form of acknowledgement. It's something that, uh, there, that individual peoples who need that they, they needed to get that, they needed to hear that. But it lives the moment it's uttered and then dies the moment it's uttered. It's only heard by the people who heard it. Um, so there has to be a way for institutions like the Catholic Church to not just have a singular apology, but to live apologetically and to live in a way that, that consistently um, you know, uh, lives out an acknowledgement um, and then does the work of undoing the harm. Um, and, and it has to do that in a way that is, is consistent, is cyclical, is viewed as something that never truly ends. Um, so I think that's just my take on kind of like what I've been hearing. And then I, I think I'll just speak to a little bit on the conversation again, back to reconciliation. Um, you know, I think just for for indigenous peoples, right? Um, the, the that phrase reconciliation, um, it it does seem to imply this um, this sense of uh, of coming together and of of sort of seeking a, a way to uh, return to a, a relationship that was 
that was beautiful and equal with the assumption that there once was a relationship that was beautiful and equal. Uh, and for indigenous peoples, the senses, even coming to the table, there are some things for the colonial governments that they live in that will never be on the table for true reconciliation. Uh, land return or autonomy or um, you know, different forms of uh, indigenous sovereignty. Uh, you know, some of those things for different governments may never be on the table. And so how can the US government in this situation, and from my perspective, ever, ever truly have reconciliation if there's never going to be right, an, an actual sort of equity um, in that? And I think for the Catholic Church, um, in terms of the, the, this identity as perpetrator, um, the, the other thing that I've heard consistently across the, the board in terms of doing this work is that healing is for everyone. Healing isn't just for the victim of trauma and of injustice. Healing is also for the perpetrators of that injustice. And they have to do serious work um, that isn't always connected to just listening to the victims. Um, I think that's often where uh, those who sit in the perpetrator seat, um, you know, think that that's where their work really is, is in, is in silence and in listening. That is a part of it, um, but it has to go beyond that. Um, and it actually cannot rely on the victims and uh, the, those who were you know, harmed. Uh, it cannot rely on them um, for the perpetrator to, to move toward their own healing. That also has to come from within. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's commenting on a lot of things that happened. But okay. Wrong. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Thank you again for excellent comments. I, as I hear your comments, I'm uh, scrolling through the um, many questions now have been asked. And as I'm listening to you, I realize some of the questions are you've answered or you've addressed uh, while doing that. And um, so I want to try to pick out some questions that maybe um, deal with things that you haven't uh, answered yet. Uh, let me try this. Uh, uh, Maria Lucia Zapata asks a couple questions. One, she says, one of the challenges we have in Colombia is how to promote the incoming report from the Truth Commission. What is the experience of South Africa and Canada in creating and or adapting pedagogies for the dissemination of the TRC? And then she also asked what educational strategies have worked. Now, I know that in the case of the um, uh, N Native Americans, we're not talking about a TRC. You've even expressed some possible uh, uh, reservations about that. But here's the question is, um, is there a constructive role for kind of educating the wider public on these injustices um, in the case of the the, the, the South Dakota um, Indian case. And then in the Peter John Pearson case, maybe the question of Maria Zapata is, has the TRC been kind of adequately absorbed among the South African public? Does more need to happen or have they moved on and are there new lessons now? You can you can go ahead. Um, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Peter John, maybe Peter John, and then, um. I, I think it hasn't been sufficiently absorbed. Um, at the time it was happening, and for a time after that, it was um, the idea was that much of it would be transmitted through radio. Radio is the most uh, used way in rural and in urban areas that most people use to get their news, that most people listen to um, and has a, have as a source of accompaniment in their day's work, uh, much more than television. Um, and so tremendous effort was put into what could almost be called a, a pedagogy of um, the radio um, and of transmitting and of ensuring um, that there were summaries and that people were interviewed extensively um, to a less extent on, on television too. And it was hoped that that would be, because they are such um, widely used models of communication, that that would be a, the chief uh, 
kind of way of relaying things and people talking about it. Um, and it's had a certain following, it's true. But um, there's been nothing to um, continue those conversations. There've been a few groups in churches and in civil society organizations. Um, there've been a few um, dissatisfied, unhappy, um, uh, short-changed people who've, um, who've raised um, questions in the public space. Um, but there's been no um, uh, sustained pedagogical um, uh, attempt um, to take it further. And again, as I said earlier, I think that is one of the areas of unfinished business um, that we still have to deal with. We, there was perhaps in retrospect, As Marcus said, the question of land, um, the question of in on that has sufficiently followed up. And where it has happened, it's been left to um, individuals who feel strongly about it to um, to work on it. So it's an unsatisfactory situation. Raka Black Elk, do you want to speak, speak to that uh, question of dissemination um, how to achieve a larger awareness among the society? Yeah, I mean, education is a hugely important aspect of this work. Um, you know, I think it was the case in Canada um, that prior to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, something like, uh, you know, less than 20% of Canadians, might even have been less than that, uh, even knew about the residential school history in Canada. Uh, and what the First Nations people, Indigenous peoples of Canada, had faced in that in that system, I think in the and it was, and it wasn't until after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but I think now the number is nearing seventy percent or so. Um, so the same is true in the United States. Many people don't know about this history, and that's the greatest barrier to any form of engagement in a truth and reconciliation or healing process. If people don't know the the history or the experiences or the depth of those experiences or even can begin to sympathize or empathize with those experiences people's initial reactions especially those who are far removed from it will be dismissive um, and will be sort of a, a what's a what's the big deal or i don't understand or or whatever it may have you right so so the 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 issue of educating the greater public uh, is really important to even helping people understand why uh, this these things need to be addressed and and why these things need to be taken seriously uh, because again without information people are going to uh, their, their, their tendency will be to sort of deflect um, you know I think in particular um, what's really important in the educational process is also engaging in not just a, a sharing of, of the history and, and sort of like the, the bare facts, right? But also in an, an interpretation of those facts that's, that's helpful uh, in moving this process forward. Um, in, when, it come, when it comes to the, the boarding school history in the United States, especially the role of the Catholic Church in running, at least in the United States, what we, what we think we know right now is that over one third of these boarding schools were run directly by the Catholic, by, by Catholic um, uh, orders of, and, and, and other um, Catholic uh, uh, groups. Um, that for especially many non-Indigenous Catholics, um, the initial reaction to hearing about this history is an immediate defensiveness um, of the church uh, and, a, and, a, and a desire to 
uh, you know, say things like, oh, but, but people didn't know any better or it was the culture of the time and they were just doing what they thought was right. Um, it requires a deep level of education to help people overcome those kinds of, I think, very um, uh, unhelpful um, thoughts about this history and, and especially those who are in the position of perpetrator. Um, because we have to have a serious conversation in the Catholic Church about its role in, in colonial history, its role in sort of promoting a particular kind of, of Christianity that was rooted in white supremacy, um, and the, the deleterious after effects of that that we still deal with today. Um, and so that's part of that serious conversation is the, the need for education. Great, thank you. Well, as is true with um, Zoom, uh, as is true with reconciliation processes, it's also true with Zoom panels. They're uh, messy, partial, um, often uh, have to be very uh, individuated and flexible and adaptable. And um, in, in that light, we're very blessed to have the entrance of Bishop Matthew Kuka, who um, comes to us from Nigeria, where there has been so much attention uh, to um, uh, religious violence in the headlines recently. And um, what I'm going to suggest is um, he's, uh, we, we, we were supposed to be done at two o'clock, and yet, yet I think I've been given permission, as I understand it, from our organizers to uh, extend this for a few minutes. So, um, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, I'm going to have uh, just speak to us for about five minutes about issues of truth, reconciliation, and peace building. Quickly, he's the bishop of the Diocese of Sokota in Nigeria, um, was a member of the Nigerian Investigation Commission of Human Rights Violations, um, and uh, has done numerous leadership roles uh, in, in the church and in the government in Nigeria. I'm, I'm just I'm not going to lay them all out because we uh, have pressures to um, with our time to get right to him. So let me give the floor to um, uh, my my friend and um, his um, our, our uh, the esteemed uh, Bishop uh, Matthew Kuka. Yes, I can hear you well. Well, thank you very much. A friend of mine has just said to me, better late than never. Hmm. Um, in a way, I think my problems are a metaphor for the difficulties of transitions. Um, <laughs> so, it, you know, it, just as well, we're in the right place. But, you know, very briefly, I'm not sure that uh, what I'm going to say has not been said by my friend, John Peter, um, and other speakers. Um, and from my own little experience, you know, from being a member of the of the of our own equivalent of the Truth Commission in Nigeria, and I think the narratives are basically the same: the divergence between expectations uh, and hopes, uh, and then the reality that people face subsequently. Um, when they came on stream in the in the in the nineties, uh, Truth Commissions were bandied around as if they were the solutions to. Uh, transitions from tyranny and dictatorship to democracy. So I think ordinary people had an assumption that these transitions, if they led to democracy at all, the fruits will be justice, peace, freedom, and so on and so forth. Um, tragically, as the stories in Africa suggest, and uh, where do we start? The, 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 the poster boy for, for the TRC around the world is the Truth Commission. Um, and of course, uh, in South Africa, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu of blessed memory, of course, across the world, held up as the poster child of, uh, of the TRC and its hopes. But as the people of South Africa and the rest of us know, uh, once the transitions came to an end and democracy was supposed to have started, one of the first uh, red flags that Archbishop Tutu raised was to tell the new parliamentarians in South Africa to get out the gravy trends of privilege. Of course, as the world knows, he ended up living outside South Africa. So the challenges, of course, of building democracies uh, against the backdrop of dictatorships are enormous. And most African countries, Nigeria in particular, 
found that unlike South Africa, for example, where the if you like, in black and white. But in the Nigerian situation, the problems were all black because it was black people that had inflicted difficulties on their people. And um, just to tell you how little we have traveled, it's that uh, between 1999 and now, um, we still have a, a military president. Uh, after the end of military rule, it was a, a military general that became our president. And subsequently, just to tell you how little progress we have made, we still have a military general as our president. It is therefore little wonder that this, this journey has proved to be a challenge and a source of great difficulties for our people. Um, the churches, of course, have continued to play their roles, the roles that they played even the, before the emergence of the modern state, namely being beside the people in terms of providing education, providing health. Um, and if you fast forward, the church's in involvement and engagement with the state right across the continent and in other parts of the world um, has remained quite consistent. And therefore, the issues of transitional justice have to focus on, as I said, the, you know, the distinction between the, the unmet expectations of people and the realities and the sense of foreboding that people feel that um, very, the old order never really manages to transit. The challenge is, of course, going forward, if you look at the situation we have in Nigeria, where bandits and uh, banditry has taken over uh, and consumed a lot of the gains that we had made, and that we also ended up with tragically with a president whose military background and lack of disposition towards the principles of democracy and democratization have also made even the little gains that we made um, a few a few years earlier. Uh, most of those gains have been eroded because the country is far more divided now than it has ever been, in part because the military, our Muslim president um, has just never developed a sense of fairness in in terms of power sharing, the allocation of positions, the allocation of uh, developing an inclusive system. Uh, the result, as I said, is that we are far worse off in terms of uh, relationships than we were uh, before the coming of, uh, you know, before the end of, uh, of, 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 of military dictatorship. The challenges, of course, still remain, and I'll try and end, uh, that we still have to contest the issues of uh, what democracy really means and its ability to deliver. Um, because ordinary people expected that by now, the end of military rule or the end of tyranny was going to be synonymous with freedom, and that freedom was going to come with more food on the table. Um, but for, for the better part of this year, for example, Nigerian universities have remained closed. Um, increasingly, people have become quite desperate and despondent. As I'm talking to you, two of my priests have been in captivity. They've been in the hands of bandits for the, you know, for the last three weeks along with two other lay people. And these are the realities that the church is facing. So it is increasingly finding it very difficult, you know, to confront these problems as well as, you know, deploy its resources for what it was meant to be. A diocese like Sokoto, for example, the idea that uh, we are having to negotiate and pay bandits money that we don't have. And this is our story across the country. So the challenges are enormous, um, but since we market hope, we continue to encourage our people that there is no alternative to democracy. But we're also pushing the political class to appreciate that their inability to perform can only lead our countries into anarchy. Um, so as we say in Nigeria here, um, we, we, in God we trust. Uh, the task ahead of us is enormous, but we thank you for, for undertaking an initiative of this nature. And, um, it's a long journey to freedom, as man has said, long walk to freedom. But I think, as I said, our people have, have been sure when they come out to, to vote. Uh, they have embraced democracy and they have no wish to go back, you know, to any other form of government. And that in itself is a major plus. So it's a difficult journey, but this, the, our churches still have the moral authority to continue to lead our people, you know, to a land in which freedom, uh, justice and fairness uh, can can take root. So let me let me end there and thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, uh, Your Excellence, and I. Um, that that's a very important snapshot of Nigeria, particularly vexing problems uh, uh, confronted there. Um, we do have a maybe a ten minutes for questions. I'm informed by 
uh, Jerry Powers. And uh, so we get a little bit of uh, your time and maybe even might even have a little bit of discussion back with uh, Maka Black Elk and Father Peter John. Uh, but I have a question for you. Um, it seems to me much of your um, very important work and inspiring leadership has been around bridge building, building bridges with Muslim leaders. Um, you know, we talked about the concept of reconciliation with some critiques um, suggested both by Maka Black Elk and Peter John Pearson, but you've been a kind of uh, important leader of this. But let me ask you, um, I mean, in the face of large scale religious violence and the face of the violence perpetrated by um, Boko Haram, the Fulani herdsmen and so forth, um, what a skeptic might say that reconciliation needs to take a back seat to the priority of simply stopping this violence. And in fact, with with force if possible, that until these bombings stop, until the um, kidnapping stop, until um, these you know forces are defeated, that um, you know bridge building and so forth must uh, kind of take a back seat. Um, now that's just I'm just offering a kind of critique here that somebody might ask to see what what you would say about that. Um, is there a kind of prioritization that is warranted towards much more traditional forms of politics and military action? Well, look, I mean, in truth, there is no substitute for engagement. We just can't, there's no other way. Every war in, in human history has ended up around a table. Of course, the, the conversations have become very difficult. Um, the policies of government have made dialogue extraordinarily difficult. But i just give you two quick examples. I came, I was at the funeral of the 40 people who were murdered you know, in the in the in the church in 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 Owo. I was I was I was at the mass, um, but also I mean, the, when I look back, I come from Sokoto, we are just about maybe uh, forty kilometers outside the the, the 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 city of Sokoto a year or so ago. Uh, Sixty five people were slaughtered by by the same bandits. So I think that uh, there is need for dialogue, in part because. Um, the policies of government have never really favored Muslims, uh, even though this, this, this president has blatantly demonstrated that commitment. But it has not made the North uh, safe. It has not made Northerners any richer. They are far, they still remain poorer, posting the most negative indices of growth and development. Um, i just give you a simple example. I mean, uh, just this afternoon, you know, there's a project one of my priests dealing with JDPC has been working on. And it's a project to 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 uh, where we, we, we're going to participate in seven schools, for example, in Sokoto, just to teach children the issues of dialogue, reconciliation, the need for friendships, and so on and so forth. And this afternoon, um, you know, my my priest who is in charge of the project calls me to say, look, um, the people in the ministry are saying, oh. Bishop Kuka is sending people to come and convert our children, you know, to become Muslims. These are the, the, the serious problems that we involved in dialogue face. The Northern Muslim elite has remained quite averse to the whole idea of bridge building. Let me put it that way, beyond the political exigencies of bridge, of bridge building. But from the point of view of bridge building as power sharing, letting people co cooperate and collaborate, they're not prepared to put a lot of attention to that. It's almost as if people are thriving from the ignorance of, 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 of our people. It's almost as if people, people. I mean, this this a huge group of young people who are illiterate, uh, they are important because they are, they are fodder for the political ambition of the elite. So there are challenges, but as I said, uh, and the challenges are enormous, but it will be wrong, you know, and some of us continue to push this point that, look, in the last five, six, or seven years, more people have died in northern Nigeria than they have in the rest of, you know, in the rest of the country. Um, just two, three days ago, an old man who was on his way to a hospital with his wife in, in, into Sokoto got kidnapped. The kidnapper saw how sick he was. They released him. He decided he was he would better go and die at home. He makes a U-turn, takes a different route, and then he's, he falls into another group of bandits. So he's kidnapped twice in less than six hours in a day. So the, the, the problems that are before us as Nigerians are enormous. And it will be a mistake for us to, especially for us as Christians, to pull back. We must continue, as I use the metaphor, walking towards these barking dogs.
Okay, very good. Yeah, great, great answer. Th thank you. And um, I'm uh, <clears throat> I was told we had till two twenty, so I might uh, try to get in one one more question for all three panelists to ask. And this has to do with a concept in which I'm very interested in, but which is no nobody has uh, mentioned at all. Uh, I can kind of understand why, but um, is the question of forgiveness now? There are many, many deep criticisms of forgiveness in the area of transitional justice and reconciliation. It is said that it disempowers victims and that it's utopian and so forth. And yet, um, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we have uh, a very strong teaching about uh, forgiveness. The Jesus gives the example of the parable of the unforgiving servant, which implies a, it seems to be even an obligation um, and to forgive. Um, can and should forgiveness have a place in peace building? So let's hear a, a very brief answer, uh, if that is possible, from uh, each of our three panelists. Whichever wants, wants to go first, go ahead. Well, OK. I mean, let me probably make a, you know, take a shot. First of all, forgiveness is conditional. And as you know very well, as a Catholic, I mean, you cannot forgive. You cannot obtain forgiveness until you have um, appreciated the gravity of your sin, and then uh, you also have a deep commitment to never repeating the same thing again. Um, this is a, the, the problem that we have in Africa is a problem of politics and the whole question of what really is truth and what really is confession. There's nowhere to, to, to look at this drama than what happened in South Africa. And even in our own situation, we like to say, people will like to say they want to hear the truth. And we make it sound as if truth necessarily leads to reconciliation. The two things are not the same. Sometimes the most important thing in these initiatives is that they help us to confront our ugly past. The question is whether the political elite can provide the navigational aid to help our people walk and limp towards uh, you know, reconciliation. And for many people, especially for us in Africa, I found in the course of, my, of this work that the European models of reconciliation really were not working, which are largely focusing on, on legalisms and so on. For us in Africa, a lot of those things, people find forgiveness, express forgiveness in, the, you know, in different ways. And many communities, you see this when even after a crisis, even when houses have been burned, even when churches and mosques have been burned, in many communities, people go get together, the perpetrators occasionally and the victims getting together to reconstruct their lives. So it's uh, if you look at it from the theology, the politics of it tells us a slightly different context. Right? If only the African leaders can find the capacity to help our people, very often a well, a drink, a, you know, a well for people to drink water, a road can, you know, can serve as, a, as an evidence of people's forgiveness and willingness to, you know, to be able to, Reconcile. So it's not just about because people have sinned against one another. Uh, so that would be my view that uh, we have to continue on the on the way. But the politicians have to develop the political will to make reconciliation easier for our people. Okay. Thank you, uh, Maka Black Elk on forgiveness. Yes. Thank you. It's it's a very um, it's a very challenging concept and, and topic. I think. Again, what I've learned most deeply from the people who are communicating and expressing their, their experiences and, and their trauma, forgiveness is ultimately something um, that's internal and something that people achieve through, I, I think Bishop had it right, Bishop Pugeta, that it has to be something that you understand the gravity of and therefore, if you're the perpetrator, right, that's something you come to because you've gained a, a deep level of understanding through your own work. If you are the victim of violence, I think forgiveness is also a very difficult task and something that requires a deep sense of, of um, of understanding of how that trauma has impacted you and how you begin to even overcome it. One of the things that I'll just say really briefly is, you know, sometimes in this work, um, I get from people who are really skeptical of truth and reconciliation and healing as a process saying to me things like, you know, oh, isn't this just going to drum up, um, you know, all this unnecessary anger? Isn't this just, just going to divide us? Um, why can't people just get over it? Um, and one of the things I respond to when people say that is, 
that's the goal. The goal is to overcome. The goal is to get to a place where the trauma no longer holds people back and no longer forces people into a space of, of deep pain. Uh, the goal is to overcome, but there's so much work that needs to happen to get in, to, to get there. And I think forgiveness ultimately for the individual, especially on the victim side, is a sign of getting closer to that overcoming um, when they can find themselves in a space able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very, very thoughtful answer. Um, uh, very good. Um, <clears throat> I'm told we have a few more questions, um, a few more minutes to uh, answer questions. Um, we have um, Raju Bhatt, who has contributed to us many terrific questions. I think it is only fair that I uh, ask one of them. And um, he says, uh, how can truth be brought forward when the perpetrators have not dealt with self-forgiveness and are still hiding in shame? Now, Maka Black Elk spoke about perpetrators, so I, you already have addressed that in some insightful ways. But are there ways, are there kind of practices or um, actions that can kind of serve to bring out perpetrators to a place of acknowledgement, repentance, maybe self-forgiveness. And we've heard of, I just read of the case of a priest who had committed uh, sex abuse, but who had just committed suicide in many cases like that. Um, is there a kind of, is there a place for healing of the perpetrators? And how, how do we kind of br bring, bring them out to, you know, both of you have deep experience in the church. What would you say about that? Bishop Kuka, maybe you can each go in order and address yeah. that. Of, of, all, of all places and of all people, the person that I, that I, found, I will refer to now, it may sound scandalous, but it's very interesting. It's Mike Tyson. I watched a video uh, last night of Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield. If, if you remember, uh, he was the world boxing champion. And when they had a fight, um, he decided to bite off the ear of uh, Evander Holyfield. And I saw a video which really caught my attention last night. Mike Tyson and Nevada Holyfield were brought together. And the question was, you know, about, about reconciliation. Now, of course, you might say Mike Tyson had already been fined $3 million, which he paid a long time ago. But Mike Tyson said something that caught my attention. He said, look, I had forgiven Evander Holyfield. But deep down inside me, I didn't think the forgiveness was enough because I needed to see him face to face. And both of them were brought together. And, more, you know, it was for me, you know, a very emotional thing. What that tells you is that most of the things we're talking about forgiveness are not necessarily tied to theology. People live these realities every day. Um, and circumstance, it depends on the circumstances uh, and the conditions, because sometimes if the condition is not favorable, and people think only of the victim, they often, we often all forget that the, even the perpetrator needs to be brought to the table. And we bring, we sometimes bring the perpetrator to the table thinking that all that needs to happen is for him to be punished and that, that him or her to be punished and that the punishment is a compensation. But uh, the, the, the stories are often slightly different. As you can see, uh, I'm talking from Nigeria. We've done what we do best. Looks like there may be some problems there from uh, Bishop Kuka's yeah. end. Well, the problem oh, yeah, we can hear you again. Good. Yeah, okay. I'm speaking in darkness. So. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Yeah, well, the light, the light just went off. This is what we live with if you live in Nigeria. So, but anyway, mm. sorry. Um, <laughs> I was just making the point, you know, that um, sometimes the conditions, circumstances, other mediators, whether they are friends and so on and so forth, can make this happen. But we've always tended to focus on the victim, you know, forgetting that even the, 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 the perpetrator 
requires uh, to be brought to the table. Now, how we bring the perpetrator to the table, as I said, is a, is a, is a function of many factors. And this is why, as I said, in the course of this conversation, we must see ourselves as a community with different people and different agents making their contributions to make this happen, because it's not something for just two or three people to do. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a brilliant, uh, brilliant answer. You know, I, um, uh, it seems to me that we've now lost uh, Father Peter John and um, Maka Black Elk, which makes you the last uh, um, panelist standing, Bishop Kuka, even though you were also the last to enter. So maybe there's something biblical about that, uh, perhaps. But uh, I want to say that despite all the um, uh, twists and turns, we've had a very, very insightful panel. I thank you for that. I thank the questioners for adding great questions. I hope um, the best of them I was able to convey, and I'm sorry if anybody didn't get to uh, ask an urgent question. I thank again our our panelists for, for joining us so graciously and um, helping us you know, with some some great new uh, and, and very insightful uh, comments on um, truth, reconciliation, and peace building. So I bid everybody adieu and thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.